Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this last seminar. In this, we are almost in Christmas, and we are very glad to have with us um, Yo Yehudi. I hope pronouncing this right uh, from the Open Life Science. It is a uh, an um, non-profit training company dedicated to be the uh, global network of open research ambassadors. And before that. Um, Yo yeah, used to be an open source research software engineer, and um, yeah, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to the talk. Uh, so I'll do the classic uh, share screen thingy. Perfect. Okay. Hey, folks. Uh, so yeah, it's lovely to meet you. Um, I will be asking questions during this talk. Uh, so don't, don't get too sleepy. <laughs> um, but I'm excited today to talk a bit about uh, code um, and research software, but I mean any code, whether that's a single line of R that you've copied and pasted from Stack Overflow, or whether that is something elaborate that's taken months or years to write. Um, and ways that making it reproducible and making it open uh, strengthen your research. Um, so to start off, if you want to see the slides, um, there's a URL at the bottom. Uh, so if you go to bit.ly slash basil dash repro, um, then you should be able to view the Google slides and follow along. Um, and the license at the bottom, the Creative Commons attribution license means that if you want to reuse any of my slides, so long as you say where you got them, then you're welcome to do anything you'd like to do with them. Um, hopefully I stalled long enough that if anyone did want to get that link open, you have it open. Um, and so I will tell you a bit about who I am and why I'm talking about this today. Um, so since 2022, I've worked as the executive director of an organization called OLS, um, which uh, sort of some of my previous history explains why um, I co-founded it with some of my uh, with the other directors who work on this. Uh, but mostly we care about making sure that everyone has access to research, um, to participating and creating research, whether you are in the ivory tower, uh, in academia, in Europe, in North America, um, or any other continent in the world. Um, and so we, we run training um, and mentoring and provide a lot of networking that helps people work together collaboratively. Um, sometimes I like to joke that um, we're really, really good if we're researchers at research, but you may get promoted because you wrote a great paper, um, and yet never really have been taught much about community building and about staff management and things like that, but they're actually super important and they're a big focus of what we really care about. Um, apart from that, I did a lot of my academic career backwards. Uh, so I have been writing code on a regular basis for, I'm going to say since about 2000. Um, and I, I've worked in the past in industry, for example, for a mattress retail company. Um, and the thing that kind of caught my eye around academia, uh, right at the bottom in the bright pink 2013 there, I happened to end up working for an academic spin out company. And I saw people with PhDs and I thought, you know what? They're actually just people. They're not like, you know, super, super smart beyond the comprehension of anyone. They're people and they've done a long degree. Um, but also, and this might be an embarrassing admission, I um, I got to go to Venice like three times in about three months, and I'm like, whoa, academics travel? I know what I want to do now. Um, and then I sort of set my sights, saw this exciting job at the University of Cambridge, worked as a research software engineer at Cambridge for five years, um, whilst I finished my bachelor's after I started at Cambridge. Um, so again, did everything backwards. <laughs> Um, but I am finally on the end of a doctoral degree as well. So I just need to submit final amendments on my thesis, which I've already defended. And then finally, when people call me doctor, I want to say, actually, I'm not, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. But I spent um, most recently coding was probably working at Cambridge um, five years as a research software engineer. Um, and so that's a lot of what really made me excited and interested around open science, open source. Uh, and part of the reason that led me to co-found OLS uh, is that I wanted to make sure that people know 
how to effectively share their research and share their work in ways that bring people in um, and that enriches the work for everyone. I'm just quickly going to check what's in chat in case it's something I should be paying attention to. No, it's just the, the link for my slides. Nothing I need to worry about. Perfect. Right. Okay. So I said stay awake. Um, my first question I'm going to ask, can you please put in chat your answers to what is reproducibility? And I am not afraid to leave awkward silences. So I need to see quite a few answers coming in and then I will... Uh, share some of those so that the people on the recording can see that as well. Please do add in chat what you think reproducibility is. Okay, we've got a few nice answers come in here. If you have anything else that you'd like to add, please do. But I will read them out, um, quite a few of these, thanks to everyone who's contributed. Uh, so we have uh, from Samuel, being able to rerun an analysis and get the same results. Uh, Ian says repeat process. Paul has compatibility with different software and hardware versions. Interesting one. Being able to reproduce the results by uh, someone else with the same data and code. Uh, I guess that assumes a computational analysis, although uh, reproducibility, of course, can be non-computational as well. Uh, same results within error over many trials. Um, being able to to obtain consistent results in the same input and environment. I really like that one. Uh, the same input and environment. Um, hopefully, usually you do get the same results. Um, I think the previous result we have, here, uh, the previous answer here, same results um, within error over many trials. So sometimes, uh, some talks I've seen about reproducibility, people put beautiful um, charts and say, this is rec replicability, and this is reproducibility, and this is reusability. Um, and of course, sometimes it means you're running the same experiment and you get the same results. Sometimes it's a different experiment that uh, is designed to reproduce the same results. To be honest, I'm not too fussed about the differences between the concepts like that. I think when we're thinking about the scientific endeavor, a lot of what we care about is that we're doing things that people can trust. And part of that is that if you try to rerun the steps that someone else has, uh, that it seems to make sense. Um, there's also scenarios where I think good research can be done that may not be easily reproducible. Uh, for example, I do a lot of qualitative research, which involves interviews. Um, and if I summarize 20 interviews, which is, trust me, a lot, a lot of work, if you have 20, 20 minute interviews, there's going to be weeks and weeks of analysis. It's unlikely that if I ran 20 more interviews, I'd get the same results. But that doesn't mean that my research isn't necessarily good. It just means that it is a slightly different type of research that I'm working on. Um, and we have one other answer here. Findings are robust, reliable, and not merely the result of chance or specific conditions. I like that one as well. I think that sort of aligns with the way I was thinking um, around making sure that our results are at least somewhat trustworthy. It's the same reason we share methods when we write a paper and uh, say, here's how I got this. And if you want to rerun it, here's how you'd do the same. Um, so it looks like we roughly agree on what reproducibility is. Um, so I'd like to talk about why it matters from a computational sense. And I know you can see my second question, <laughs> which is tell me about a time scientific software was wrong, because I bet you've all seen one or more. Sometimes those sensations in the news, maybe there's a link or there's a, an Excel spreadsheet you want to complain about, or maybe it was a COVID thing. But I'd love to see a few examples of a time when it really mattered that someone did something wrong um, and what led to it. So my my initial response uh, to try trying to run it on a Mac made me made me laugh. I am um, I admit using a Mac right now, um, but I think if I left this slide in the deck, I do have an example where I say you know depending on what what environment you have, the instructions may be useless if you um, wrote the instructions on a Mac and you're running Windows or Linux for example. Um, but does anyone have any other examples, maybe the, the news sensations, something that was wrong. If, if not, I have some, so don't worry too much, but I bet you have some too. Ooh, ooh, I like it. I would like to see more, if there's any links to get a bit more info about that one. Uh, so Samuel says, a coding error that reversed the conclusion from a randomized control trial. Um, 
I'm sure that those are a thing. I don't have an example of that myself, um, but I'll show you some of the examples of what I do have. Now, let me just move the chat window so it's not hiding all of my slides. Um, so this was uh, an Excel error um, in which uh, there was a large economic case for um, austerity, for less public spending, um, but the calculations weren't public. And at some point, one of the students said, hey, can I see your Excel spreadsheet, please? And he sends them the spreadsheet and it was wrong. And actually, the numbers that were used to create a case for um, a reduction of public spending and money were wrong. And instead, they predicted growth, economic growth, rather than um, economic shrinkage, which was the uh, previous fear when the numbers had been mistaken. Um, so there's some links there at the bottom if you want to look at that. I'll also thank the Turing Way. This is a slide from them that I reused, and they talk a lot about data science and reproducibility. Excel auto correction error. Thank you um, for including that one. Is that, and I haven't looked at it yet, is that the same as this one? <laughs> I don't know if it is or not. Um, but in the United Kingdom and the early days of COVID, uh, we... It's in genetics. Oh, of course, it's in genetics. Yes. When your um, gene name suddenly becomes a month or the scenarios where someone uh, where, where genes have literally been renamed because Excel kept on breaking them. It's, it's it gives me sadness to think about that, but it absolutely is a real thing. Um, uh, the, the example I have here, this COVID one, um, when I say we, the United Kingdom, which is where I'm uh, speaking from. Um, the United Kingdom used XLS, not XLSX, so an older form of an Excel spreadsheet, and there were too many cases to fit on the spreadsheet, and so thousands and thousands of cases very early on uh, in the tracking were absolutely lost and unreported uh, because we were just using the wrong file format, and it was something that no one could really see or understand or spot what was going on. Um, so the, the theory I'm working with here is that when things are more likely to be open, it is easier to spot. Um, I will always say openness does not create reproducibility, but very often it is necessary in order to get reproducibility. Necessary but not sufficient is perhaps the way that I would put that. Um, so, for example, if I have some very, very hard to read code that I throw online, even if it's open, if <laughs> no one can understand it, that won't be very reproducible, but if it wasn't open, it would be even less likely to be reproducible. Um, we have another example uh, in the chat. 40,000 fMRI papers might be wrong because of the SPM software's package. Oh my god. <laughs> I, um, the, the, the mental weight of 40,000 papers makes me a little bit itchy in the brains, but thank you for sharing them. Ah, and we have a link to the RCT error as described as well. Thank you very much for sharing that. I will be taking a look at these uh, and I will thank you all. Some of those will probably end up in my slides for next time. So thank you everyone who's been sharing these. These are great. I mean, no, they're awful. They're really awful. <laughs> but they're good examples of why it's important that we share as much as we can so that we can spot some of these errors early on um, and so that we can fix them as well. So um, peer review helps some, but not always a lot. Um, so I, I remember I actually have a friend who said at one point that he's not convinced that uh, peer review does much more than make the, the, the one, the two, the three people who reviewed it them happy with the paper and doesn't necessarily result in um, a perfect paper at the end. Uh, this example here from Ronald Fisher says uh, that it may be consulting experts after the experiment is finished is equivalent to running a post-mortem examination. Um, is this to say that you may not be able to change a lot by the end. Um, that said, I think it's great. I think it's important. I will never say we shouldn't be doing peer review. But uh, I think it's important to think about what we can do during the post process of creating the research uh, towards reproducibility and not only afterwards, because it's a lot easier to fix something before you do it than it is to fix it after. Um, or as to, to reframe what I was trying, my, my point that I was trying to make here as the open research and reproducibility tend to work hand in hand. Um, 
So some of the things that I learned when I was working as a software engineer, and this wasn't always in academia, uh, in my experience, and I don't know if this is sacrilegious to say, uh, but <laughs> coding in academia and coding outside is pretty similar. Um, I don't, I've never found that academia was especially special or different when it came to writing code. Uh, big teams and small teams, everyone makes mistakes, but if I had a big team, there was more chance of the weird stuff being spotted than if I did it on my own, because someone else would have to run through the same steps, they'd have to um, ask me questions, which would improve my documentation um, and make, make it more likely that the steps followed to do what I've done uh, will be followable by someone else. Um, and to expand that a little bit more, bigger and more varied teams creates better software or better code. Uh, when I say software, I do mean code. Even You might not think of yourself as a software engineer at all, but if you are writing code and you're doing computational analyses um, and code is one of your methods to produce results, then um, I am speaking towards you uh, and I hope that you can you can agree with a lot of the points I'm making. Um, but I've got three examples of other types of gaps and bugs that uh, may, may be spotted uh, when you have larger teams or may not be spotted when you're working on your own or in a small, non-diverse group. So, for example, uh, machine learning is all the rage right now in AI. Absolutely everyone is talking about it and using chat GPT to answer the emails they can't be bothered with. But um, if you look at the data set here on the right, this is a skin cancer learning data set. And it looks a lot like me. And it looks a lot like a lot of the people I can see on the call. I can't see everyone's camera, but it definitely doesn't represent the world population. It only represents the light skinned people in the world population. Uh, and the article, the DOI that I have linked on the left is written by an African-American man whose uh, wife died of skin cancer. Um, and when we use uh, code, computational code, to do things like uh, detect skin cancer or do other kinds of research, when we don't use diverse sets, uh, people people miss out uh, with, in this case, deadly consequences. Um, so that, that's one example where possibly having a single black person involved in the creation of that software would have been enough to make sure that the sample uh, training for these images would have uh, included uh, darker skinned people. Um, again, larger teams and more open broad teams won't solve everything, but they can help a lot. Um, the reason I laughed when we mentioned Mac, you'll see on the right, I talk about tool gaps where someone only only offers Linux, but you know what, I don't have Linux or vice versa. There's, there's so many scenarios and I'm not expecting everyone to have all operating systems or all browsers, but if you work openly and you have a collaborator who uses one of these other tools, then maybe you can work together to provide instructions for enough people that they can together create, uh, you know, here's what to do on Linux. Here's what to do on your Mac, and here's what to do on Windows. Um, again, open their larger teams, help build something that's slightly better. Um, and if you are a biologist, the example I have in the yellow on the left is also about BLAST, which is a very popular bit of bioinformatics software. Um, and what this particular function, the, the bug that's documented here, it was uh, a command line switch that said, please return N results. And everyone assumed that that was the top N results, like the biggest or the smallest. Uh, but actually, it just returned the first, and they weren't sorted. Um, and that is a significant difference. If you have, I don't know, 5,000 results, and it just returns the first 10 rather than the top 10, your analysis is going to be radically different. Um, and it, to some degree, I think uh, if you follow through those blogs, you see that they argued it wasn't a bug. They said people were misreading the instructions. But I will argue that usability in itself is uh, a scientific important thing. And that if usability is easy enough that you can so drastically do something wrong, then it is a bug and you shouldn't blame the user for doing what seems obvious. Um, so these are just some of the examples of ways that scientific code, when we don't necessarily um, realize it, can have significant impact and consequences. Um, I, I I do this trick. I say something and then I bring up the next slide. I'm like, that's just what I said. I've re-summarized the sentence I said last slide. But yes, scientific bugs have real world effects. <laughs> okay. Um, 
but I'm not going to pretend that it's always easy or that everyone should always make everything open um, or that if you do that, there's no there's no side effects. Um, if you've been listening this far, you may have thought, but what about <laughs> or I, I would like to do that, but I don't have enough time or maybe my PI doesn't support me or maybe I'm working with biomedical data or maybe indigenous data. Are there reasons when when you listen to this? Are there reasons you thought I don't know if I want to make my code open if I want to make it reproducible? And I would love to hear from you here um, because any real world doubts that you may be hearing or that you may have seen others express um, now will be a great time to talk about what what you've been thinking and hearing. So I will pause, take a sip of my delightful delightful lavender tea, and see if anyone has any um, hmm, but maybe you'd like to share. So we have one here, intellectual property protection. Um, does anyone have any more you'd like to share? Yep, another good one. It's a quick hack to prototype something. I bet we can manage one more. Variation, keep the competitive edge against other research groups. Ah, there we go. I was hoping for that one. Thank you, Marcia. <laughs> Unfinished code we're not yet exactly proud of. Um, keep bringing them in, folks. M more may come in. Uh, very welcome to hear more, and I will address them if I see them popping in. Um, so I'll address them again in order. I'll go back. IP protection. So this is one where if your boss says you must be protecting your IP, follow them. Absolutely. Do, do not be a martyr. Get yourself in trouble and lose your job. No point. Life's too short for that. Um, <laughs> but I will argue that many times the reasons we're doing science is that we want to build on each other's shoulders and we want to make the world better. And if we just say we want to protect it and get money that may not necessarily align with what we're worried about, uh, this is a very idealistic view and I recognize it doesn't always make the best argument depending on who you're talking with. Um, some some counter arguments for that is if your work is pub publicly funded then it seems fair that if the public is paying through their taxes into these grants that they should benefit from it without having to pay for it again. Um, but yeah sometimes that is one one reason that people don't share. Some of the others are a lot easier to uh, talk about. For example, um, the quick hack and the unfinished code we're not yet exactly proud of. And um, so, yeah, I I agree. Sometimes if something's in the middle of a mess, you might not want to share it. Uh, my argument um, is that at some point when you do feel like you should be sharing it, or if it's something at a scenario where other people need to be drawing conclusions from it, it's if it's publishable, then the code needs to be publishable too. Um, because otherwise it's incomplete and it's usually one of your methods. It's either the way that you visualized something or it's the way that you've actually produced the analysis, then it should be examinable from everyone else, uh, much the way all of the other parts of your methods might be. Um, I will also say, honestly, it's relatively rare that anyone actually looks at your code online like th there's this phrase where people say build it and they will come I don't know not unless you're famous already like my uh my bachelor's code thesis I I, I was excited about open source and I thought I'll put this online I don't think anyone's ever looked at it or if they have it's probably been because I've been curious when I said I put my bachelor's code thesis online and I don't think anyone's ever looked at it um so the chances are that you put it out there and if someone does need to view it they will, but otherwise they won't bother. Now there are scenarios where where um people look at code and say, "Ooh, this is rubbish. This is terrible." Um, they are not all that common. Um, and in my experience, people tend to also sort of say, "Hey, you know, calm down." Like they shared this. This is much better than them keeping all of those flaws in secret, like a closet where you've hidden all of your mess, and when you open it, everything falls out and there's chaos. And I mean, that's not really science. That's just like my untidy bedroom. Um, so I would say it's hard. It really is hard, but sharing things and making it available to others so that at least we can spot these errors and fix them is a lot better than letting those errors go, um, unnoticed. One of my favorite other ones, sensitive data, super important. Do not share data you shouldn't be sharing. 
right, I don't want to find out that my medical records are online. Um, maybe I like I know about uh, some animals um, at a nature reserve that I've been to. And when I spotted them, I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know there were any of those in the UK. And we don't share it because um, their breeding site is quite sensitive. And if we share their breeding site, there's a chance that the few animals in this region will be caught or disturbed in some way. So there are many good reasons not to share data. Um, but when you do write code, the fun thing is that you can create fake data that has the same shape as the original data. And that will still mean that at least your code will work and people can verify it works the way that you expect. It's also super handy because if you've been working with, I don't know, five gigabytes or 10 gigabytes of data or any hundreds and thousands of lines, it might take a long time to run. But if you have a small sample data set with 20 or 30 lines that you can use to share as you're sort of saying, here's my code, here's it's not fully reproducible because there's good reason for me not to share my data, but you can run it. But also that small data set, the sub data set, fake data set that you've just created be much faster for you to run than the big data. So there's, there's bonuses. Um, again, it helps you out when you make it reproducible. Um, and actually, I was reading a paper just this morning where someone was talking about, um, not someone was talking about, it was uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the authors was my um, NG supervisor, <laughs> um, but it was talking about forks on GitHub. And it said that projects on GitHub that have been forked, so reused by someone else, uh, have a longer length and that there was a statistically significant correlation um, that the open work, the stuff that has been forked and reused by other people is more sustainable. So you might say I'm protecting my IP. We might say you've protected your IP so hard no one ever used it. Um, and that might not be terribly what you were going for. But instead, there's an argument that by making it open, people reuse your work, people recommend you and people talk about what you've been doing. Um, some of the possible barriers anticipated, you might be worried about being held to higher, um, higher standards, you might have to support people, you might need other skills, it takes time. There's many um, arguments, maybe you don't think you'll get promotion if you spend time on things that your boss doesn't think are important. Um, and again, I would never advocate for like being an open science and a reproducibility martyr. <laughs> do what you have to do practically to get along. And then if you're the PI or you're supervising someone, you encourage them to do the way that you think it's right uh, when it's safe for you to do so. Um, but anyway, I want to talk a bit about some of the steps towards making code reproducible. Um, and I am going to ask folks, can you share, if you did one thing to make your code more reproducible today, what would it be? Please pop those in the chat. Comment better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't need to teach this seminar. You've all got it. It's beautiful. Session info. Oh, I'm trying to remember what language that is. I'm feeling embarrassed because it's not coming to me. Someone remind me what 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 coding or scripting language? It's R or Python. Okay. Now, now you're just tricking me. <laughs> it's R or Python. Um, but yes, the, I, I'm guessing that session info is information about the packages that you've used to get where you're going. Is that right? It shows that I'm not really much of an R or Python coder. There we go. <laughs> Most of my work has been web oriented. So I've done a lot of Java, JavaScript, and I will use a bit of Python and a bit of R occasionally, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. Um, Okay, yes, detailed readme's, documentation, uh, information about how to clone, install dependencies, run the code, using notebooks in an executable environment, operating system. Yeah, you all have got this. You will make beautiful reproducible code tomorrow. I'm just going to look at it and be like, yeah, no, these folks have got it. Um, so the one thing that I think I have done that I think is the most useful is giving code to someone else um, and saying, please run it and tell me how you get on. In fact, I know I have a slide for you in the future that shows this in a much prettier way. Um, offer random seed. We're, get, we're, we're getting very in depth there. Actually, uh, I will mispronounce your name dreadfully, y Yun Roy. Uh, if you could expand on offering the random seed, I have an idea where you're going, but I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Um, 
and so just a reminder that um, to emphasize, I guess, the importance of trying to do stuff from early on is that things are correctable. The sooner you notice, the more likely it is to be easy to fix. Afterwards, you may not be able to fix it all. Right. Yes, if your code depends on a specific random seed, it's not reproducible. Indeed, unless you share that random seed. But yes, I'm always nervous about magic numbers that make things required. Okay. Probabilistic models, words too hard to say, random seeds to initialize a random number generator. Yep, if you're using any of those, definitely should be sharing them. It's a foundation of an important data as part of what you're working towards. Um, so I will have a quick shout out. Um, I mentioned earlier the Turing way. Uh, they are very, very oriented towards making data science too easy not to do well. Um, and if you want to learn more or if you want to help other people learn, it's a great place to go. They do collaborations. Um, they work together. They um, There is a book. It is a massive book with many, many chapters that probably answer most of your questions. And if it doesn't, they will say, do you want to write the chapter for us? Um, so it's a great place to learn more about reproducibility if it's something that excites you when it comes to data science. Um, but some of my uh, tips around trying to make things more reproducible, track changes. So um, when, you, when, you're, when you're writing code, if you can use version control, definitely do. If you don't, and it's scary, I genuinely recommend taking some classes um, or finding a course and signing up. Um, most people use Git and GitHub. It doesn't have to be Git. It doesn't have to be GitHub, even if you do use Git. Um, but tracking those changes and like being able to identify spots where it, where things changed and when they may, may be different or when a bug was introduced makes a lot of difference. Or saying, you know, version two was when the paper was released and version three was after with these bug fixes. So tracking changes alone will make things so much more reproducible. Comments. We already had that one suggested in the chat. Comments are great. Um, write comments you don't think you need because in the future you will need them. Um, it's more about why you did something than how it works. If you need to explain how it works, the code might be more complicated than you need. Um, but I, I can't count the number of times where I've gone back and looked at my code and said, oh my God, thank you, pass me. I'm so glad you commented because otherwise I would have no idea why I wrote the code the way that you do. Um, if you use workflows, um, so there are some packages that allow you to run multiple steps over your data save information about what workflow managers you might be using, the computational environment, that's something we mentioned. So this is thing like package dependencies, operating system, verges, versions of packages. Um, and one that I think I've probably mentioned quite a few times is make your code open. Again, it's not the be all and end all of making something reproducible, but without it, it's very hard. Um, and again, even if your data can't be open, your code still can. Uh, what's next? There we go. So I knew I knew I had a pretty one saying best the single best reproducibility thing that I will recommend. Ask your friend to run your code. They will get stuck. Like uh, unless you you write perfect documentation, and if you do, please tell me how. <laughs> they will get stuck, and they'll be like, "Yo, why did you, what, this isn't working the same way that you said it would?" And at that point, you update your instructions ask them to run it again and loop that. You may need to run it two or three times through that loop, but by the end, the code and the instructions for running things will be better. Um, so I have an example. I did this for someone um, and she wrote our code, which, you know, it was great. And I sat down and I looked at the uh, notebook and I ran it, the whole thing. And she's like, it never occurred to me that you might run it from top to bottom. She's like, she, she would run line nine and 10. And then later when she needed lines 33, she'd run line 33 and then she'd run nine, 11. And she jumped back up and forth. And so it just reveals the assumptions that she'd made that were quite easily fixable once we knew what the problem was. But until you spot those assumptions with those other pairs of eyeballs from, from the open people who may be working with you, uh, until those are revealed, um, it can be hard to spot. So ask someone else, see what they tell you, fix those things. Um, 
And if you want to make things uh, reusable, then the best way to do that is to add a license, because if you don't add a software license, they won't actually have the right uh, legally to reuse your code. Um, if you don't want people to reuse it, but you want it to be reproducible, um, which is a real scenario, maybe you want something to be peer reviewed, but then you do want to, I don't know, maybe sell it, or there's some reason that you don't want people to reuse the code, um, then you don't have to have that license, but this is a good way for um, people to say, oh yeah, I can see that I'm allowed to reuse this. Much like I put the license on my slides saying, I don't mind if you reuse my slides. It's just a nice, clear, easy way to um, take text that someone else has said, say, here's, um, here's the legal uh, definition of how you can reuse my stuff, and here's how not to reuse it as well, please. Um, if you want to move on a bit further and you are even more excited about sharing your work, maybe interacting with the community, then um, using something like GitHub, it doesn't have to be GitHub, but GitHub is very set up for social coding. Um, then it allows you to record bugs, to-dos, use um, issues on a GitHub repository. And that way, if someone else can report a bug easily or they can say, I know how to fix this, would you like me to? And it does happen um, if you welcome them. If you say, here's how to contribute, then people may may well um, add those contributions. Um, add a code of conduct. Say, hey, if you're working on my project, be a cool person. Um, and it means people are more likely to feel safe and interested in contributing to your work and tell them how to contact you. Um, so if they've used, I don't know, if they've used your paper and they want to reuse your code or if they've spotted a bug or anything like that, just tell them, you know, here's my email, here's my Twitter, whatever it is that you use where you will respond. Tell them how to contact you with suggestions, with offers. Um, so one of the more exciting things, I think once I'd, we had someone who actually offered to make an Android app for something I was working on. I was like, I'm not going to complain. Sure, go for it. Um, but if you don't make those pathways open, it can't happen. Um, you can make yourself citable. So um, GitHub supports setting up the citation CFF, um, and CFF stands for citation file format. Um, but you can add basically machine readable metadata if you have a GitHub repository, or even if you don't, you can add this file um, that says, here's how you cite my software when you use it. Um, you can get software, you can get a DOI for your code. Uh, Zenodo is a great place, but uh, you might have other domain specific places that you want. Um, and one of my favorites is JOS, the Journal of Open, um, is it open science software or is it open source software? I'm not sure if that's right. Um, but uh, if you're writing code, you might not really want to write a whole scientific paper about it, but you might still want to get the credit for having written your scientific code. Um, and this basically allows you to spend a page or two, describe your software, uh, what it does, how people reuse it, what the tests are like, um, and get a DOI and a publication specifically for the software rather than for the scientific results. Um, and this gets peer reviewed and peer review on GitHub with emoji is the most delightful peer review you will ever experience. So I, I highly recommend it if you're writing code that other people are going to be reusing. Um, you can also review software papers, which is nice uh, and can give you experience with other types of code than you might write. Um, looking, I haven't got too long and I want to make sure there's some question time. Uh, so uh, for reproducibility, there's so many other things that you can do, lots and lots of different tools. Um, I'm not going to go in depth into all of the different ways that you can do it. Um, start where you can. Do what you can, and the more you can, the better. Um, and yeah, I've already mentioned share the environment, so I won't belabor this slide too much. But this was a slide I was hoping to get to, um, which is the more you can share, the better. But don't think I have to do full replication, and that's so much work that I'm not going to bother at all. If you just share your code, that's better. If you can share your data, share your data. If you can have it running on a notebook or on a digital no it's code ocean um or a virtual machine or a docker if you can do those do but don't let perfection be in the way of doing something that makes it a little bit more reproducible um and sharing your code and sh or sharing your data is better than nothing and it is still important um so i i'm always nervous when i give these talks i don't want to like reproducibility and open shame people until they don't bother at all and i'll say whatever you've done well done. And if you can do a bit more, do that too. 
Um, and a good way to learn about setting up your code online, making it reproducible, what steps you need to see, how to involve other people is to do it yourself on other people's work. So um, go to your favorite library, see if they have a guide saying here's how to contribute. Um, in uh, December, which is now, although it's nearly done, there's the 24 pull requests um, initiative, which is the idea of making one new pull request or a contribution of code a day. Uh, so people will actually prepare their code repositories and say, I'm looking for help. Um, here's where to come. And there's lots of interesting new ways that you can you can try by finding out contributing to other people's code. And if they really care, they will they will step you through everything you've never done before. So they might teach you how to make a pull request on GitHub or a commit on version control. Or maybe you've never made that font color red and they will walk you through making it red. <laughs> um, but have a look for the ones who are saying we're friendly. We want to help you. We want to teach you. And then you can dip your toes in without having to know it all magically yourself. Recap some of the things I've tried to say today. Um, so. Sharing something doesn't automatically make it reusable. Do not use other people's work without attribution. Um, there is a scenario where people can say this is public domain and then you don't have to. But most of the time, just like in any um, scientific work that you're doing, you attribute and you cite people and tell people how they can cite you. Um, you can share something with a license, but you can still sell it later. That doesn't stop you. It's not giving it away for free indefinitely. There's nothing saying you can't sell something you've already licensed openly and for free. Um, just because you can reproduce something doesn't mean other people can reproduce it. That's why you ask your friend to work on it. Uh, open science and reproducible science doesn't mean violating privacy or violating sensitive data. Um, and not sharing doesn't mean that like again it's hiding things behind the closet in the closed doors just because it's behind closed doors doesn't mean that it's okay if you reveal it and you put it open it needs to be reproducible and even if you don't put it open it should be reproducible anyway so it's not a good excuse to say i'm not sharing it because it's not reproducible share what you can um I'm going to skip most of my other slides quickly just to make sure there's some question time um but just say the UNESCO says that um, not only is open science a human right, but as researchers, we have a duty to make sure that our science is open and available to other people. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about ways to apply open science and open research methods to what you're doing, I run a program called Open Seeds uh, with hundreds of people around the world um, from all the green countries and probably a few more, depending on when we last updated that map. Um, and we try and work on making sure that our stuff is open and designed carefully to be open. We're running training for NASA next year in the NASA's Open Science um, 101 curriculum, uh, which you can sign up uh, sometime next year. We'll be announcing when the cohorts start, if that sounds exciting to you. And thank you to my funders. Think about what real world things you could do to help your reproducibility today. <laughs>